let's pop out the chat. Pop out the chat. Let's shift the YouTube away. Alright. Let's get some stuff rolling and some money. Money, 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 money. Gotta earn the money. Can't do much if you can't earn money. Unless you're living in a socialist utopia world, in that case you can just get money for nothing. Hey Travis, crazy, Yindi Yamara, welcome, congratulations on making it, been wondering where you've been, how's everything going? You doing alright out there, probably baking, I dare say you could probably cook a kangaroo roast just by leaving it in the car for half a day. Travis, I was not going to say that, but yes, that's where we're heading. Uh, let's see. I was going to say a lamb roast, but I don't know if there's many sheep out that way, so I figured kangaroo roast is probably not too far off. The only downside of kangaroo is that it uh, lacks a lot of fat that we're used to, like on beef and uh, especially lamb or mutton. Yeah, kangaroo just does not have that fat, so you basically got to take your um, kangaroo and just drown it in oils of other sort. Bit rough, 45. Oh yeah, to hell with that, you know, Mara. Sorry to hear you're out there dealing with that. Hopefully, you've got some air conditioning that keeps you uh, cool. Anyway, so we've got a 1466, and uh, we love the 1466, of course. This one seems to be misbehaving, but apparently doesn't have liquid damage. It's hard to say for sure, you know, obviously the person hasn't actively been made aware of someone spilling something on it, but sometimes these things happen when the people aren't looking, like, you know, maybe one of their co-workers accidentally spilt something, then like quickly rubbed it over. You just don't know, so. Roo is a brilliant meat. Now, for some people, yeah, I just find it a bit dry. It's, I found the same with ostrich and um, especially ostrich meat. Um, ostrich is a very nice looking meat. It's got that really nice purple color. But uh, again, I sort of find I have to really add a lot of oil and everything else into it. So anyway, the pets seem to find roo meat reasonably okay. There was a hello or something rushing up the wall behind you in the corner probably a gecko and yeah it has to be cooked just right that's the other trouble is a very small margin of uh, acceptable cooking range with those meats because they are you know you take it too far and you probably could use it as vulcanized rubber all right let's get to the overhead personally I've probably got more chance of doing a nice barra on the barbecue with more chance of success Okay, damn that uh, overhead camera. I really need to get a be better overhead camera. The brightness is just way out of control. Okay. And we need a, another container. Uh, and I've been battling it out today and well the last couple of days with the supplier for the multimeter, the benchtop one that I had. <sighs> Pardon me. And they wanted a video of the fault and I was like, that's really difficult to get a hold of because it's an intermittent fault. It doesn't happen that often. So I can't really just set it up and say, here you go, here's the fault occurring. But Unfortunately, thanks to Greg, if Greg's around here, he sort of steered me in the direction I realized I could download the um, the closed captions, the auto-generated closed captions for my videos. So I did that for the last six months worth of videos. And then I searched through for key phrases like lousy piece of junk mic, uh, multimeter. or yeah, I was looking for something that would hone in on the moment that I had the fault with the multimeter and unfortunately I did find something so I've sent that off to the supplier 
And hopefully when they see that, they go, Oh my gosh, yes, Mr. Daniels was actually telling the truth and wasn't trying to scam us. This is a legitimate problem. Ever eaten galah? You boil it with a brick and when the... Br <laughs> so, <laughs> so you have galah-flavored galah brick. Are they really that bad? Oh, man. It's not something I would try. Okay, let's get the battery disconnected. Let's get the stickers on. Ah, let's put the sticker into the system. Come here. Thank you. Uh, Galahs are very different to cockatoos. I mean, they are the same family, but cockatoos and galahs, they do have very different personalities. Hey Kopez, how's it going? If you see them in the wild, you'll understand the differences between a cockatoo and a galah. They both hang out in groups. Galahs are just stupid crazy birds up to all sorts of antics in a very different way to what a sulfur crested cockatoo does. I'm trying to think of the right way to describe their differences, but they are very different in their behavior and in their appearances. Galahs of this nice sort of pink white complex, whereas, of course, sulfur crested cockatoos are basically all white with a, a very brilliant yellow crest on them, hence being called sulfur crested. And we get them all around here as well. We have quite a lot of different bird species in this area, which is quite nice. A hey, Catherine. Gary, scrub turkey. Yeah, I think there's a scrub turkeys are a bit of a nuisance sometimes. They get into your trash. We do get guinea fowl around here too. Obviously, some people have let them run them around. Apparently, you can tell the difference between domesticated and wild guinea fowl by their colouring. I don't know how true that is, but that's what I've heard. Ah, oh, Yuniyamara, there you go. Yuniyamara pretty much summed it up perfectly. <laughs> Glass an idiot. Cockatoo's smart, but raucous. Hey, Pedro, good to see you. Uh, let's see, multi, uh, power supply is up. So let's see what happens when we do plug this in. So we get green light. Nothing happening. 33 milliamps. Very interesting. You love eating echidna. Most divine meat ever. We get a lot of echidnas over here. Um, the season for them pretty much has finished up now, but uh, a few months ago you'd see them around a lot because they'll be in their mating season. So you'd end up this uh, trail of echidnas walking around sometimes. I think the worst thing is those when domestic dogs start trying to attack echidnas. I mean, they can't really do much with them because if for those of you... Uh, who don't know what an echidna is it's, it's basically like it's a spiny d thing it's not really like a uh, porcupine people think they're the same but they're not they're quite different the echidna spines aren't that that sharp but you do have to be careful handling them but the real trick is it's trying to pick up an echidna is downright near impossible unless you can get right in underneath it if you try to grab it from above you will not be able to grab it they just it's hard to describe why you can't pick them up. Anyway, we get a fair few of them around here. The cats love watching them um, because the echidnas are on the outside of the enclosure. But the cats will just sit there for hours watching these echidnas dig around and get up to their mischief. Alright, so 33. And nothing showing up. That means we've got a fat short somewhere probably. I don't know. Anyone want to place their bets for tonight's board? Glass sucked. <laughs> 
Well, I think we can all agree probably the worst eating is, of course, the introduced cane toad. Not many things will go for the cane toad. I know the um, killback snake will. So if you do see a killback snake, please don't harm them. In fact, if you see any snakes, please don't harm them. But killbacks are one of the very few animals in Australia that can eat the introduced cane toad. Most of the time they'll go for the tadpoles, but they will eat the adults as well. They are not immune to the poison or the toxin of the cane toad but they can tolerate a certain amount of it. The other critter that can handle it is the um, quoll. I think the northern quoll can eat them. But again, only a certain limit. Or is it the northern quoll that's really susceptible to them? I can't remember. Anyway, there's another marsupial that can chomp away on them without too much damage, but it will still make them sick. Carp and cane toads. Ah, oh, yeah, the carp in the Murray River is just an atrocity. We do our best up here to control the cane toads. We basically just go around, collect them up, bag them, uh, euthanize them. And, but yeah, you could do that and you'll clear up your area. Give it three months and you're uh, overrun again with them. I really don't know what we can do about it. It's very unfortunate that they managed to get a foothold. And of course, as you know, they're heading to the kakadu. Well, they're in the kakadu now. Uh, yeah, that's a real problem. Because they weren't there when we were up in the Kakadu, but they were getting across the Queensland border or getting close to it, up through the York. But uh, since then, I mean, to be fair, that's getting on 30 plus years, 40, 40 years now. Yeah. I don't trust this new virus of the carp. Yeah, there's probably going to be something that will... There'll be a jump. The other problem, of course, is if it is really effective, say like myxomatosis, then you're going to have all that um, organic load in the river system. And of course, as they die, they're just going to suck all the oxygen up out of the water and everything else is going to go with it. So I don't know what they're going to do about that. I mean, they can continue to manually fish them out, but that's a hell of a job too. Hey, AJ. Yeah, I'm not the... Yeah, okay, you must be talking about the other people being the wise elders, because I'm not. Murray Cod are just getting back to being a decent amount. They may just have to constantly manually fish out the introduced carp, because it's that or the virus, I don't know. I mean, it's already hard enough for anything to stay alive in the Murray system. It's been abused to hell with all the irrigation. I mean, I know irrigation is a necessity for modern life, but there seems to be a hell of a lot of corruption and you know, misappropriation of the water, stealing water, things like that. And nobody seems to think about the actual condition of the river itself until it's too late. It's like up here, uh, you may have heard they talk about this scheme called the Bradford Scheme, where they envisage taking all the water from, say, the Burdekin uh, River system and piping it down to the um, sort of inner southeast. And it's like, well, yeah, that water is actually needed up here because if we don't flush those rivers out, all the ecosystems up here are going to suffer. And then you're going to have this huge loss of water trying to get it all the way down south. So um, yeah, it's just going to be a loss all around. It's one of those schemes made up when someone was half drunk, I'd say. Just because the map says it's below our area doesn't mean gravity is going to help you. What do the red roos eat to get so big? Well, they're just mostly grass. But yeah, they're, they're big suckers. Alright, this is going to be interesting. Hmm. There we go. There's our cap. Spotted it. Bam. I knew it would be something like that.
the downside is this means it's going to be a very short stream. Red roos eat grey roos. <laughs> we get um, we get wallaroos here, you know. Man. The first time I saw a wallaroo, I gotta admit, I pretty much nearly crapped my pants. Because he was just out in the paddock here, and I was just walking up the road. And he was eating grass or whatever, and he sticks himself up. And I thought, well, you're a little bit big for a grey, and you're a little bit small for a red, but you're, a, yeah, you're like Mike Tyson or something. You do not want to mess with a Rollaroo. Those things are just incredibly muscular. I do worry though, because there's a bunch of lunatics on the road here who drive way too fast. And I'm worried that that Wallaroo is going to just get unlucky, jump out at the wrong time, and it's going to be the end of him. And that's going to be a really sad day. And if it's not the cars, it'll be the damn dogs that are running around wild around here. Or the people. Yeah, you get some people and they just, they'll shoot at anything that moves. Like, oh, look, a roo, shoot it, mate. It's like, fine if you're going to actually, you know, if you're out there making, getting yourself a meal or whatever. But these guys, they just shoot for the fun of it. Alright, let's see if this boots now. I was having a panic there for a minute. I couldn't see any exploded caps or corrosion. I was thinking my guess was going to be wrong. And that was going to be something, that was going to be hard sort of thing to swallow, admitting that I was wrong. I'm just going to put the fan in for a little bit of extra drama. Ooh, it's actually still dead. Okay, that's a bad sign. Still 33. Alright. Well, I found my cap, but obviously I haven't found the fault. That's actually kind of concerning. Even more concerning is my lack of multimeter software. Okay, I've clearly got the wrong port. Oh, for goodness sake. This is why I want to get... This is why I need to get a, another bench meter as soon as possible. Oh, you're killing me. That's better. That took way too long. Alright, so it looks like we will get to explore a little more. So we've got a dead cap there, but it may have taken out a lot more, or it could have been something else that caused that cap to die, as opposed to the cap dying and being the fault. So let's have a look at our voltages. 1.3, that's not very good for PB bus. 3.4, okay, so we've still got issues on PP bus. 
Hmm. 1.3. Not good. There's not enough current. We've only got half a watt going through, so I can't really blame it on any infrared yet. So we'll have another look. Let's see if we can spot another fault. PV bus fuse. Yeah, except I probed it on this side. Alright, we're testing the fuse. It'd be funny if it is another zombie fuse. You gotta be kidding. What is going on here? Okay. The fuse. I refuse to view that the fuse is dead. I'm just gonna plug it in, check the voltage. If we get 18 something on one side and nothing on the other. Okay, so 1.3, 8.5. Okay, we've got a dead fuse. Who said that? Who said the fuse? Crazy Joe, you get an internet point today. You got that right. Well done. And thank you for reminding me of fundamentals. Paul cannot refuse the fuse, yeah. That part's so big I could almost do it without the microscope now. Let's see if I can actually do that without the... It is very strange to do board repair work without the microscope. Four or five years ago it was no problem. Now, fat chance. It's also a lot harder because you can't see when the solder is starting to become liquid. Yeah, this is hard. Yeah, I don't think I want to try that again. Yeah, Travis, that's pretty much it. Well, that wasn't a zombie fuse, that was genuinely dead, that one. Or at least I'm pretty sure. Because it was reading pretty much open circuit. I think the voltage that we were picking up was just sort of like a voltage that comes through the various chips and parts on the board that happen to also have a connection to the PP bus, so it's kind of like a bleed voltage. Right, I don't believe I've got a replacement fuse for that model as a new device, so I'll just use an old one. Thank you, Unimar. Thank you for dropping in. It was good to see you again. And also thank you for providing the clarification between galas and cockatoos. I did need that. Much appreciated. And I will see you next time. And you take care of yourself and uh, hopefully the heat doesn't beat you up too much. Yeah, that fuse is fine. Well, it's not the prettiest fuse, but it will do. Hey Greg, oh Greg, did I tell you you saw my YouTube link 
on Twitter where I found although it wasn't the multimeter the, the handheld one that I pulled out it was a good enough spot of video that I, hopefully I can convince the damn supplier that the meter is a problem I'm fairly sure I was sufficiently emphatic about being upset about it Uh, my email address, it should be on my website, the pldaniels at gmail.com. I do have vanity domains, but I really don't use them. Yeah, early 2000, everybody was wanting vanity domains, but in the end, it's just easy to go Gmail these days. Plus, Gmail's got superior filtering. Which is amusing to me, considering that I made my early fortune writing and selling email filtering servers, software. Kind of glad I don't do that anymore. That was hard work. Crikey. Not that this isn't hard work, but... No. It was still hard work doing that other stuff. Because the things would change so rapidly between email server program uh, daemons changing like postfix and send mail and stuff like that and then the spammers changing their techniques finding new problems in uh, the decoding engines of different applications like outlook was always a favorite one stuff like that Yeah, in the end, Greg, what I did is I just downloaded all the closed captions through YouTube DL. I didn't have to download the videos, I could just do the captions only. And then I just grepped through them and found the one that had the most likely hit, then checked the video, and it took me about three or four shots before I finally found the one I wanted. got a new fuse we don't have a replacement cap yet I'll wait till it's running we don't need the cap for it to run certainly not the under normal lightweight loads like this pardon me um Greg I did try that extension of the first few times and yeah it's a great extension I do like that Certainly, if you know the video that uh, you know the video that you want, and you're trying to find where in that video, if it's like two or three hours, I've got it installed on my Chrome now, so it's going to be good. All right, sorry. Uh, here we go. Fan spin lights. Wait for the green blinky that people can't see because the blooming damn it. There we go. Come on, give us green blinky. Hopefully it hasn't killed the machine. Hey, green blink. We're good. So we just got to put the cap back on. And I might actually be able to clean this up without having to ultrasonic it. That'd be nice. Has it become a PC yet? The moment I touched it, it became a PC. Uh, okay. I was going to say, these are slightly different, I think. Oh no, it's that one down there. Right. Hey, Zam, encoder. I'm just going to take any one of these. I'll try and make it a little easier for it to get detached. I'll just put some leaded solder down. These caps don't like being heated too much with the hot air. They do have a bit of a predisposition to cracking and popping.
I tell you, I can't wait to get a new workshop where I can make myself a really good fume hood and a proper soundproof enclosure for the ultrasonic. Yeah, there's so many things that I want to do to improve the workspace. Yeah, make it better for me to do work in. Okay, there we go. Haircut's getting, yeah, it's getting there, it's getting there. It just grows through that phase. You chop it off, look like a weirdo for a few weeks, but then it gets better. My wife says I'm like Carol Brady from the Brady Bunch. You can do anything, yeah, you can chainsaw the hair off and it still ends up somehow looking okay. Yeah, Pedro would be occupational health and safety compliant. That'd be nice. Kodo, I was looking for some donor boards on AliExpress earlier. Is it normal to have them solve no CPU RAM? Yeah, that's standard. Anything that's actually valuable on those boards, they take off. RAM, CPU, PCH, and sometimes controllers. By ISLs and whatnot, depending on the uh, yeah the model. So yeah, it is entirely normal, and do not be surprised if the one that turns up looks like it's actually spent a month sitting in the swamp. That's entirely normal. Big holes drilled in them. Yep. Hey, let's try to see if we can clean this up so we don't have to actually ultrasonic this board. It's preferable to not have to ultrasonic everything. But sometimes you just can't get the flux sufficiently cleared out and you've got no choice. You have to succumb to the ultrasonic cleaning. Damn it, and I'm thinking I'm already there. Nah. From a technical perspective, well, from a realistic perspective, the amount of flux on there, if I do wash it over with the alcohol, yeah, clear, clear away most of it, it should not be a problem. It's merely a... It's an aesthetic thing for me. It's like I do not like having these areas where you can see something was wiped away. Yeah, that just... It just knocks me. Oh, I gotta fix up that hinge. Whereas conversely, it's like these are two boards that I've just cleaned up today and the actual you know, board surface it's that nice consistent matte colouring no blobs of uh, flux or anything that's how you really want them when you ship them back to the customer oh. uh, maybe I'm, I'm just going to have to resign myself to that being a job that I have to put through the ultrasonic as much as I don't want to scrub it with some ultrasonic solution I don't think so that's very that's rather caustic that stuff and then you'd have to rinse it out with water and then stick it through the drying Uh, well, probably need to have the thermal paste fixed up on it anyway. There we go. I'm not going to ultrasonic that until I finish this video. I will do it tonight because the ultrasonic cleaner is up to temperature. 
but I won't do it while on video because it's just too annoying. I like to be able to just walk out of the room while it's doing it. Yeah, but even the stuff, I have to rinse it with water afterwards. I can't, if I get that uh, solution that is in the tank on my hands and things like that, it uh, does tend to make you feel a bit funny afterwards. 371. Zam, thank you for the 229 euro. Yes, flex board view. I need to get some more work done on that. I am doing a lot of stuff in the background that you obviously don't see until the final release occurs. But there's plenty of work being done on it, particularly with the open board integration stuff. It's going to be really nice when you can just sit down, open up a board, and get the open board data up, uh, make changes to it, and then choose to synchronize those changes upstream. The downside for some people is that, of course, in order to do that, you need to be connected to the internet and you need to make the connection and do the transfer. So there's going to be a degree of anonymity lost. Let's see, what is this? This is 365. 365. Put these machines back together, may as well. Yep, Martin can see you. What? Where's Pelnoff? Is he around? But I can't see him. At least I don't think I can. That is way too much. Ah, oh, that is... Must be an air bubble in there. It's no good. There's six skills. Maybe just try a refresh, but I imagine people have already tried that. Hey, Jim. Sorry to hear that. Missed all the action too. We're at the tail end of everything. Sorry, Jim. All we're doing right now is putting stuff together. It's interesting, I've just noticed that it's been knocked off. Are you kidding me? Something I have been noticing with these heat sinks or heat pipes lately is that the tie down end on the finder section, the screw point here, it's a separate assembly from the actual finder section. I'm starting to get a number of them just dropping off. So they're breaking off. And I'm starting to think I'm not going to bother putting them back on. Don't know why they're breaking off, but they are. Just squish, squish, squish. Squishing it and moving around like that. Make sure that the layer of the thermal transfer paste is as thin as possible. Trying to think, was this the backlight one or the SMC one? 
that's the backlight one. This is the one we did last night with the backlight failure and the corrosion around here and the controller. Just getting that back together. Hey, yo. What is it? How do you pronounce that? Hamdallah. I hope. The 3X. Oh, Pianoff's here, right. Now I can see your Pianoff. Have I forgotten anything? I've got the rubber shroud on. Yep, everything's good. Sometimes you got to ask yourself these things. It can be easy to forget. And then 10 minutes later you're cursing because you've got to reassemble or disassemble everything once more. Depends what you mean by using a Mac there, Christian. I mean, I've got, I use a Mac for entertainment in the evenings when I'm like watching TV. I use an iMac for my workstation as in my administration machine. But this whole assembly here and my data recovery systems are all Linux. I do also have a Windows recovery system, but that's... The Windows basically is only used for, funnily enough, iTunes, and actually it's not even true. It's used for 3U tools. And I use 3U tools on Windows because it is very easy to do backups of people's phones without risking iTunes going crazy and deciding to try and make every phone that you plug into your computer one of your own. So. I can't stand that behavior it has. It seems to be only a Windows thing too. If you do it on a Mac iTunes, it doesn't try and do that ownership synchronized thing. I could be misreading it, but when I plug in an iPhone and it starts saying synchronizing to Paul Daniels, and I'm like, whoa, 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 this is a customer's phone. And then sure enough, you look at the phone name and it's changed it to your name. So I don't know why it does that. I don't like it. iTunes has control issues. That it most certainly does. So yeah, so that's why I use three U tool three U tools. Uh Jay, maybe they're just preparing to for the uh Windows is Linux with the Windows desktop manager. I don't know if they'll actually really ever do that. But it is an amusing thought experiment. I'd say the biggest problem with getting commercial software on Linux a lot of the time is the fact that Linux itself is such a moving target uh, in terms of development, it's a very moving target. So you code it to make it all run for today's platform, then it changes on you too dramatically the next day. And that is part of the um, part of the Linux mantra, as it were, I guess. I mean, it's intentional to break everything. But I think, well, I don't know. At some point they might have to become mature. Stop changing things every 10 weeks. Andrew Hughes, Blaze, hello. I've got Linux going on my Chromebook. Hmm. Hey Paul Hal. Hey Mr. Anonym. Sorry, a few people I didn't see slip in there. 
Ah, uh, I hate this. My experience here is many driver problems on Windows is Linux. Yes. I would tend to agree with you, Pernov, yes. I think what's helped a lot for Linux is the trend that we seem to be seeing of there being more of a universal uh, API layer, well, maybe not API, but um, like take say the universal video, um, what is it, universal video protocol or UVP or something like that, and then also same for audio devices. So we've got this generic layer or interface that everybody can use and that just makes it easy for the manufacturers, it makes it easy for the driver riders, that sort of thing. I'm not talking about USB. God no, that's a disaster. But um, yeah, a lot of the video devices that I plug into Linux now will show up as a UVB or something like that. Let's see what it is. USB video, yeah, I can't think of it, anyway. But just having some sort of standard, even if it's not the best standard, is better than no standard when it comes to trying to get people to write stuff that your system can support. UVC, that could be it. What's the C stand for? Universal Video Communications? Universal Video something? But prior to that, it was an absolute nightmare trying to get anything like that to run on Linux. I don't know if anyone remembers in the early 2000s when software modems became a bit of a thing. That yeah, was a bloomin' nightmare. But this is back in the days of dial-up. USB video device class. Ah, okay. Thanks. But yeah, you, you essentially had to have, for every different software modem, you end up having to have a special driver for it to load the right firmware and things like that. It was a nightmare. Now, thankfully, we don't have that. Uh, printers are another bit of a problem. Like I know my HP P1005, or was it 1005P2, whatever it is. It needs firmware loaded in each time I restart. It's a pain. Personally, I prefer printers when they can talk on the Ethernet port and they've got their own built-in postscript. So all you do is you just send postscript to them and that's it. End of the day. The other second acceptable alternative is, um, what is it, what's the HP one, HCL, HPL, HGL, something like that. The sort of thing you'd see in the HP LaserJet 4s and whatnot, and it became a bit of a second standard for cheaper devices behind PostScript. I think it was PCL4 or PCL, printer control language, that's it, PCL. So yeah, if you, you can support PostScript and you can support PCL, you're fine. So when you've got good standards for that kind of thing then it does make it a lot easier to support the devices At least with AJ, at least with Linux, I mean, the kernel is basically the same. 
the desktop, I don't know what they're going to do about it because neither the KDE QT based system or the GNOME GDK based system, uh, they're both not very appealing to me. I think something like Mate or um, X, what's another one? There's a sort of a lightweight mid range one. I can't think of its name. Anyway, but the trouble is everybody wants to have what they feel is the best in terms of a desktop. So they create these new desktop management systems or window management systems. And that's great for them, but yeah, it's um, we're kind of making it worse for ourselves because there's no standard for application makers to write to. So in the end you're making all these compromises and the applications don't really have a consistent look and feel. Yeah, it always looks a bit half-assed. Martin, no, yeah, 3U Tools is a nice application for the fact it's simple, direct, does what you want. Like you just press back up and it backs up your phone. It doesn't do any trickery, nothing like that. It just does what it says it does on the box. Yeah. So what I have with my backup machine is, th it's just like a Intel J1800 or J1900 CPU, and I have a little 128 gig solid state drive in it. But then I also have, in a swappable tray, you know, just a front loader tray thing. Every oh. It's like one or two gigs, or so, uh, one or two terabyte drive I'll just throw in there. And then when that fills up, I take the drive out, put another one in there. And that makes it very easy for me to keep very long-term backups of customer phones. It's not because I want to snoot through their stuff, but it's because I know that a lot of people have this tendency of six to 12 months later going, oh, I busted my phone. You didn't still happen to have a backup of it, did you by chance? And so that's what you can do. You can just pull out the old drive, fire it up, give them their backup. I do, of course, ask the customer to say, look, do you not want this to you know, be persistent? I won't do it if you don't want me to. But I find most people are more than happy to have a backup of their phone somewhere around. And most of them will just take it home in a little stick. Hey, Mario, thank you. 149 pound what can that get you these days get you half a pint even though I don't drink beer no oh. a quarter pint what is a quarter pint that's about yeah I don't know I use i3 on Arch Linux XFCE thank you very much Tunji glad to see some people working around in the background there answering my questions that I don't know the answers to. Oh, I love the unicorn, by the way. I just saw the unicorn. Uh, what's going on here? We may actually have a keyboard fault here now that I'm looking at it. Hey Tony W. Well, I did respond to the power, but that's not a guarantee. Oh, we've lost backlight again. Oh, sh shoot. Alright, now I know what I've done here. Okay, remember when I was, we did this backlight yesterday or whatever it was, and there were those two pins that were, they were dodgy. So I am thinking that maybe they are not functional, because I am getting a display, but I'm not getting a backlight. So what I'll do is I'll now plug this into an external display, 
and see whether we've blown the backlight, which will be fantastic, or whether we have to do a cable replacement on this screen. I'm not sure which, I'd, I'd certainly much rather a blown fuse. This is the downside of if you don't get a job finished in the one sitting, it can lead to these issues. So yeah, that was that was my mistake. Not a good one to make. I think we blew the fuse. That's not even plugged in right anywhere, but that's not the cause of the problem. Damn it. I just wasted that entire repair. Fortunately, we haven't damaged the contacts, so that's good. I'm just going to plug it in and then check the resistance to ground on the backlight. Yeah, that's bad news. Yep, they're shorted in there. Bugger. So, as I said, this is why it's a bad idea to have repairs split over multiple sessions, particularly when you're doing YouTube. Often, I don't do the second part of a repair on the YouTube. Typically, what I'll do. So I'll do the one, the first section, and then once that's done, it just uh, goes to background. Okay. Okay, so yeah, the... Sorry, I'm just... Again, I have multiple things here. Three, seven... Yeah, three, seven, six. You can stay over there. Mr. Hedgehog, it's been a while since I've seen you. How are you, good sir? Where have you been? Digging in the ground like a hedgehog? Alright. Um, well, Murphy is certainly earning his keep today because this means I now have to take the entire board out because I need to... or do I have to now? Basically, I need to take the screen out, split the front off it, and change the cable. Seems like you'd only have to review the first video. But the trouble is, reviewing the first video is... It takes time. And it should have been in my notes, but I will admit that was my own personal oversight there. See ya, 3X. Okay. Murphy was an optimist. I uh, do often hear that. So we'll get this screen off and then we will split it and hopefully change the cable without significant damage. Why don't you do console repairs? I do occasionally do a Nintendo Switch, but overall it's a, something just fell on my hair. Uh, 
What the f The hell is that a spider that just fell out of my hair? Something fell out of my hair and it looked kind of creepy crawly. Oh well, I'm still alive. It's all good. Didn't die today. Paul magically remembers that the damn camera has to come out too. Ach, nee. Words starting with the letter F. <laughs> Crikey, mate. Yep. Full disassembly required. You try to short circuit these things, get around it by taking a couple of steps less, but it just makes things longer. Barry. Uh, silly, yeah, the, the big problem I've got is just simply lack of space at this point. Oh wow, that is... A, never had a clutch cover one to come off so easy before. Or at least it pretending that it wouldn't come off easy. <laughs> oh, clutch cover? You said you wanted to... Any more bank updates? No, nothing yet. Not until... At least... Tuesday or Wednesday, probably Wednesday next week, so we've still got a week to go. And that'll be because I'm waiting on the bank evaluators to turn up. So until that happens, there's really not a lot I can do. Get the heat pad out. The most difficult part I find with this process is just getting it started. That is, getting the first separation of the frame away from the glass so that I can then pull through with the the string or the spudger whichever I feel comfortable with on the time <sighs> Jim yours what your home loan refinance comes through tomorrow nice well, I'm glad that's working out for you, at least. Let's see. drag this off the edge because it's sitting up there. I usually like to try and start up around this corner here. There yes, welcome. Hey Nelson. Hmm. 
pizza warmer. Yes, that's exactly what it isn't. AJ, what, what, two hours trying to speak to the Commonwealth Bank. Ah, well, you have my sympathies there. It's very tricky at this point in time. Now, the only bits of advice I can give with doing this kind of work is that one, don't try and attack it from the outside coming in because what usually happens is that you just damage that rubber seal that's there and once you've damaged that you won't get it back on properly rang in three times the past month same thing crikey really jeez what are you trying to get don't you have a branch there Can this work with hot air? Yes, you can use hot air. I prefer not to because there's a... You can make a... It might be easy to make a mistake and accidentally put too much hot air in one spot on the LCD panel itself and you will cause a permanent discoloration. Whereas at least with this, yeah, you're not going to... The chance of causing permanent discoloration at 80 centigrade is not very high. Okay. What was that? Yeah. Crikey, this is a tough one. There we go, gotcha. Almost through, almost through. I'm trying real hard not to upset that rubber. I have seen some people who can do this process exceedingly well, very quickly. They're absolute masters at it, unlike myself. I don't know, they've just got the confidence and the feel to do it very quickly, and that is not me. But they certainly have my respect and awe. Yeah, it might be easier if I actually go from the tight end first. Flip sake. Okay, so I'm worried about doing damage to that seal. I'm be accused of clubbing it. Hey, finally.
And of course, naturally, it's all gone cold now. So I'll put it back on the heat. Yeah, it's just wax string. This is 0.6 millimeter diameter wax string. It is a little weak for this job, but you know, um, so long as you don't rub it too much against the edge of the frame or the um, front bezel, it should be okay. I saw some hot stones. No, uh, still got to heat them up though, don't I? Hey, fixing things. How's it going? Soak thread and IPA. I don't want any IPA around this area. It all it takes is one drop to spread in the wrong area, and you've ruined your display. Better to try and take your time with this sort of job than rush it and have to cough up for a display. Floss, yeah, it's too weak and too small. It is 80 Copaz, yes. But it's not freedom units, it's adult units. It, okay. I find it easier if I go across the top sides first bugger at least once you go through yeah you know, once you've got the starter then restarting it again is pretty trivial I said restarting it again is pretty trivial there we go <laughs> You do need to be careful when you come around to this area because there are two flexes there and it's not too difficult to accidentally snag them. And if you snag them and you like, just drag through them, you will have a dead display. Okay, it's getting a bit cold there. Like I said, better to take your time. Really should put some more... Actually, I might just do it from this side. Does the iFact, iFixit heat pad help with just a minute? Never tried one myself, but from what I've heard from people who do this sort of thing a lot, they aren't worth, they are not worth getting. Any way to swap that hideous silver blazer to black, you could always take it off and paint it. <clears throat> Pardon me. Who's Daniel? Daniel Cotiga, my name is actually Paul. I don't know what it is about my name, but I get a lot of people calling me Daniel and, um, I don't mean to be offensive, but it's a little bit annoying after a while. Even the bank email people have occasionally called me Daniel, and it's like, ugh, oh, man. I might be able to shuck this.
Uh, the trouble with shucking is that it has a tendency of picking up the actual adhesive. Yeah, picked up the adhesive, whereas the wax string doesn't tend to pick up the adhesive. So if you just pull it up and gentle, you should avoid that flex. Should. You'll know if you catch it, believe me, you'll know. So will your customer. Yeah, we completely shredded it. We didn't. Uh, it needs a little bit more heat. Damn it. Okay, this is where I will take a chance with the hot air. Set to 250. Full blast and just point it to the outside. Keep your distance. There. there you go. Beautiful. Well, you can see here, this is where I shucked it, and it doesn't do a good job. It messes things up. So, definitely prefer the string. Fixing things. Expect a few phone iPhone 12 glass repairs. All the glass. What? The ceramic glass is not even protected on the sides like the older style LCDs with the bezel. So they've just got exposed glass as the impact taker. That's brilliant. It means Apple gets a lot more replacement phones done. Yeah, these are the flexors. So you can see if you accidentally like, get the f leading edge of them, you can very quickly ruin your day. I'm sure one of these days it's going to happen to me, and I'm very sure I will cry a lot. Fortunately, at least 1466 screens are now becoming almost affordable. easier if you take this Wi-Fi assembly off. I think you can probably do it with the assembly still in place, but yeah, it's just another thing to get in your way. screws then there is also under the seal 
lift the seal up slightly and there is a metal plate bridging across here you just gotta let's just hold on by a piece of tape but you do need to get it out Get the screen to flip up and give the flex some. Nope, want that back. There we go. You can't really see the detail there, so I'll show under the microscope. You can see we've just pushed it over, unclip it, remove it. Uh, Barry, at least you're only watching it. Okay, now what I'm going to do is verify that it is in fact the flex that's faulty. We wouldn't want to actually replace the flex only to find that it wasn't the flex. Adrian Higgins, thank you. That's the confidence money, is it? Okay, so the cable is indeed shorted, so that's a good sign. First thing you do with these cables, once you know they're damaged, throw them in the bin. Don't be a dimwit like me and hold on to it thinking, I'm going to use that connector one day. Because otherwise I can guarantee you that you will accidentally pick it up and go, Hey look, this is a perfectly good looking cable. Why haven't I used it? Why is it sitting here? And you'll find out. You'll find out. Okay, new cable. We'll just cut the cable, but then again, you know, what's the point? It's just going to sit around and get dirty anyway. Yeah, you may as well toss it if you're not going to use it. Or at least that's my point of, my point of view. Particularly in a workshop like this where you lose track of things because you don't you're not hyper pedantic or OCD and you don't keep full inventory on every single thing that you have. Okay, just be gentle getting this back in, but there we go, clipped. And then you just lift that up a little. And I should be able to just pull it through. There we go. And hopefully we haven't done any damage. It's a bit of a bend in there so you can push this down. Reinstall that metal DB decker. That's the professional name for it, the DB decker. I feel like that's actually been installed backwards. I could have sworn that they actually were the other way around. But this one is in fact installed this way because the tape is on that was on that end. Anyway, that's how they did it. Don't blame me. Apple did it that way. Yes, DB Dacker is the uh, official term. Now, no, the cable suffered a failure because it had corrosion, and the corrosion caused the backlight pins to 
essentially fuse onto the ground plane at some point somewhere. Okay, put that Wi-Fi system back on. I am not a great fan of having to do this particular process, but at least it is doable. You know, some of the jobs that you come across, you sort of think, nah, nah, I don't think I'm going to do that. I'll just cough up the extra money and you know, buy a new display system. The uh, first thing that comes to mind in that respect is the display flex gate issues. Now, I know it would be a repeat problem, but at the same time, I don't really fancy going along and wiring up 20 or 30 fine wires that will probably fail anyway. Hey Corey, how's it going? Fixing things, how's the family? Well, yeah, we're all just uh, waiting out to hear from how the home loan goes. Just everybody on tenter hooks. <sighs> right, put the T eights in. Yeah, there's no denying, with regards to the M1, there's no denying it works well in the environment in which it's designed for. And I mean, that's basically what they did. They said, what do we actually have to make this thing work for? Whatever we don't need to make it work for, we just cut that out. And then we can make it work just for the design that we have. It's smart thinking. The downside, of course, is that it does... Yeah, it may become a in uh, a limitation later, but who knows? Apple do seem to be pretty good at shifting between architectures. Okay. That's all done. Do you test before reassembly? <laughs> Why did you just ask me that? Why? You, you like... Yeah. You're the sort of person that gets kicked out of the workshop. Saying things like that. Asking questions like that. What are you, an apprentice? So the unspoken rules. Well, the clutch cover certainly doesn't want to go back on. <laughs> All right, let, let's follow the example of the apprentice and let us test. Shut up, Gecko. Alright, let's see how we go. 
Hey, you need triple five. Currents are good. Screen flashed over, so that's a good. Damn it. Oh, right. Ugh. We haven't changed the backlight views yet. Damn it, Apprentice making us do stuff that we didn't have to just then. Gave us a panic moment. See, this is why apprentices get kicked out of rooms. Ah. First thing we do is we'll get this bezel back on. really does need to get warm again and then I'll just you know, put a bit of pressure on it. Um, that clutch cover. Honestly, yeah, I understand the concept of these clutch covers, but by golly, they can be a stress-inducing process of getting them on and off, even though you know what they should be doing. There we go. Finally, back on. Right here, that fuse. Oh boy. Well, at least the fuse did its job, eh? Wasn't that good? Um, yeah, Corey, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> that is what I'm doing, Corey. <laughs> I do realize that is how they come on and off, but they have a tendency to not always line their notches up at the right place, and so as you're trying to slide it, one buckles out, you know, they're imperfect little creatures. Corey senses the aggro in me now. <laughs> He's like, okay, I'm out of here, Paul's gone a little bit crazy. Cecilia, I was actually thinking of getting a, maybe a um, Mac Mini, but eh, we'll see. No, don't go join forces with the MOSFET. Nelson, it was actually the same device that you're looking at right now. Precisely the same device.
Oh, that's just a smidgen awful. All this because I don't want to use hot air. Freaking awful. Oh, let's try that again, shall we? Hey, Ictac Durban. Hey, Durban. How's it going, Durban? Alright, so that's that's working. You can see down there. So everything's good now. Blimey, that was fun. And by fun, I mean that in a very sarcastic way. In case people can't understand sarcasm. Yep, privacy shield engaged. Alright, now we can put this thing back together. Ugh. The reason why I screw in at least one of these hinge screws for each side before I fold it down is because I don't like to unduly stress the assembly. Oh yeah. So at least if you do that, you know, it uh, stops it from having a edge stress point or anything like that. You better not be too short. It's getting close to the point where I need to go to bed. Yeah, that's too short. So I can't mongrel. You should be able to just draw this out. This one seems reluctant to do so. Good enough yet?
Let's try to draw it a little more. I am holding the... I'm pulling on the cable, not the... Not the connector itself. In case people are freaking out. Okay, that's better. It only takes about a millimeter or so. It's enough to make a difference. Pull it until it sounds expensive. <laughs> I like that. Uh, that's pretty much true. It's kind of like um, tightening up bolts. Talk it till it, yeah, until you get that sickening feeling in your stomach. Reminds me of the first motorbike I had, except it was kind of in the opposite. Um, the motorbike, it had, what was I doing? Oh, that's right, I was just trying to adjust the valve tappets. It was a shim over, no, shim under bucket system, which means that you have to take the cams off. And this is a twin overhead cam motorbike, single cylinder, so it wasn't too dramatic. And in the process of taking that off, somehow or another, it seems one of the head bolts decided, even though I was relinquishing it of its duty to hold the head down, it decided to snap. So I had this head bolt embedded into the um, embedded into the cylinder section. And I had to then take that off. Thankfully it was able to just slide off. And then get on my push bike, because I no longer had a motorbike. And drive it right across the other side of town. With this hefty weight in my backpack. Take it to the engineering shop and get them to take the bolt out for me. But yeah, I wasn't even, I wasn't talking it up. I was actually undoing it and it snapped clean and free. Do you understand the concept of kilograms? Yes. I am a metric person. I'm mostly talking imperial units at times simply to stop certain people getting scared of the channel. Australia is both. I mean, we are officially imperial. Uh, imperial. We are officially metric. We have been for quite a long time. I'm fully versed in metric. But sometimes when dealing with humans from across the Pacific, it's easy to talk imperial. And of course, you know, some measurements are imperial. But uh, no trouble doing either or. Now, Kopez, we don't mention such names. Not after I gave him information yesterday and he just went along and made a video about it and used my name, just threw me under the bus. Didn't even ask me if it would be alright, just did it. Did you see what happened to Romain Grosjean? Slammed his... Oh, yeah, yeah, I actually saw that, yeah. That was pretty amazing. The name didn't catch with me. On the other hand, have you seen what's happened to the Acebro, Acebro telescope with the whole thing collapsing now? On the upside of that is that at least people won't be 
throwing thousands upon millions of dollars into GoFundMe's or whatever to try and maintain the place. It's end of life now. Sometimes you need to have these things happen. Okay, I need to adjust this. Sorry. The web camera drifted down into an area where. Okay, that looks okay. I think if there's anything else I need to do. Tester. Yeah, I saw that there was an earthquake involved in that, maybe triggering it over. I get most of my information from um, Scott Manley. I find him to be particularly easy on the ears and he distills information down nicely. See, fixing things with your OCD, do you always feel like you need to give it some arctic? Uh, oh, right. Uh, you mean like make sure I take the heat sink off and redo it? Uh, fortunately not, no. Where do you access Scott? Just on YouTube. Scott Manley. I'm pretty sure it's Scott Manley. Fly safe. That's his... Um, catchphrase as he finishes up each video kind of like Lewis saying I hope you learn something yeah Scott Manley he does a really good job of distilling information out uh, let's see paste oh okay yep Thanks, Kristen. Okay, one, two, three, four. He's Scottish, is he? Uh, I wasn't sure. Okay, we've got Wi-Fi. No, we don't want to access this stuff. Cancel. Two pictures are good. Yeah, Greg, hopefully it works for him. I mean, I think there's enough. Yeah, we can't really give him much more than that. Um, they kind of have to approach a little bit halfway across the bridge and accept that, yes, it was that meter I was working with, and yes, I did power cycle it, and yes, my software is reporting the values correctly. I did mention to them that if they look at the video, they'll see that I don't look at the computer screen. So I'm not actually looking at the values presented on the um, on-screen display. I'm looking at the multimeter. So I can only hope. Everyday Astro, I have a little bit of trouble hearing him properly. Maybe I'm just not used to his accent or something. Preamps, that's about right. Okay, 25, 26 frames per second, that's pretty good. Okay, heat pipes reacting properly. We're just going to check the keyboard on this.
Are you kidding? Okay, just let me know if we're still connected here. For some reason, my chat window just died out me. Alright. Okay, let's see how we go for the keyboard. Up, escape. Keyboard's good. Cap blocks is good. Is cap block yeah, that's glowing. Definitely one of the pieces of software that I am happy I wrote, even though everybody was telling me, what do you want to write that for? There's already a keyboard tester. So, but not in a way that makes it useful for me doing this sort of work. Hey, what the? Alright. Oh, well. Better check everything else, so at least I can mark down that I'm... Yep, okay, that works. What else am I supposed to do? Audio test. Okay, microphone works. We know the speakers work. Fans doing fine. So the machine's up and running again, so that's good. Alright. Shut that down. Shut down. Yeah, it's, okay, the stream's good now. Hmm. I don't know what happened there. Something must be the midnight glitches. Anyway, so that's it for tonight. And I may see you tomorrow. Depends what comes in. Maybe there won't be anything. It's just luck of the draw. Can't tell what the post person's going to bring around. So until then, you'll take care. And I will be back when I'm back. I'll catch us all later. See ya.